My name is James Coomer. Um, I recognize in the audience actually some people who worked with me over the history of uh, my career in high performance computing. Um, Josh has just left the room, I think. He's at uh, VMware now. We both used to work at Sun Microsystems. Rich from the Rich Report is just here from Sun. Uh, John Barr used to be my boss when I first started HPC at Sun Microsystems. And me and Torben used to work at Sun Microsystems together not really that long ago. Uh, Torben, you're from Sweden. No, I'm Danish. You live in Sweden? Yeah, okay. okay. Here we go. This is, this is a special one for Torben. Um, I'm based in England, uh, but I cover all of EMEA. So, <laughs> so I'm a senior technical advisor covering all of EMEA for DDN. Uh, so um, let's leave that slide up for a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's okay. We'll move on. We'll move on. Okay, it's a little bit of history of uh, DDN. I'll just talk about this slide very, very briefly, really. Uh, so DDN, um, it's the largest privately held storage company in the world. Um, we're now at uh, 500 people. We grew by about 100 last year. Got a presence in four continents, and we, um, there's not really any argument that currently we hold a, a very uh, sort of higher echelon position within the high-performance computing world. Um, and really, a lot of the experience we've had within the engineering teams at DDN has come from customers like the ones you see here, which are really pushing the limits of um, sizes of file systems, um, whichever sort of file system that is. Um, so can I just have a quick poll, just to get an idea of who I'm talking to roughly? I know there's partners and customers here. Out of the um, uh, people who run uh, systems themselves, uh, can you put your hands up, please, if you're running a system of, of some sort? Got a few hands there. And out of those people who are, who are running Lustre as a parallel file system, so we've got about <coughs> 65 people here, and that's about seven, seven or so, about maybe, maybe more. And GPFS, about equal, about another seven. And any other parallel file system? Okay, maybe some Fraunhofer's? Or? Parnassus, just decent okay. Um, good, so um, there's a number of file systems around, and uh, uh, coming on to the, kind of the, the wide product range that DataDirect Networks has, um, we kind of have a, a GPFS a system. If you look along the top line there, we'll see grid scalar, exascalar, and now scalar and extreme scalar. And I'm not only going to go into depth on any of these uh, file systems, um, just a quick overview of the range of, of systems. Um, so at the top there, essentially, we see the, the underlying file systems behind the solutions. Uh, at grid scalar, this is working off GPFS. Exascalar is working on Lustre underneath. And there's other file systems underneath NAS scalar and Extreme scalar. Uh, Extreme scalar is uh, really for very fast, uh, relatively small. In the HPC world, small can be quite big, um, but relatively small number of clients doing direct block access to file systems. NAS scalar, uh, like it sounds, um, this is for high throughput uh, clustered NAS solutions, so if you want to export NFS or SIFs into large numbers of clients. And we kind of know Lustre and, uh, and GPFS, and as we package them within our systems, they're exascalar and grid scalar. Underlying those uh, file storage solutions, there is a number of hardware uh, controllers that we've developed uh, really over the past 15 years. So inside those hardware controllers, there's um, multiple options for multiple customer scenarios. And each one of those is running, uh, especially on the SFA side, around a million lines of code that have been developed over the past uh, 15 years. A brief overview, the 9900, this is particularly for customers who want some kind of quality of service um, regarding read and writes to any, any kind of file system, parallel or not. And then the, the systems, these are three systems here, uh, uh, the SFA systems, essentially, and these go from basically small uh, to very large. And the 12K <coughs> is the latest controller uh, you can see at the end. And I've got a few slides at the end of this talk to cover the um, just a subset of the new features in, in the 12K that's being uh, GA'd at the end of this month. Uh, right on the end there is WAS, and uh, we could spend the day talking about WAS. Um, it's called, in fact. In Hamburg, I hear that there's something called the uh, WAS. Um, unfortunately, it's called this World of Sex. Um, this is a different WAS. This is the Web Object Store. Um, and what we have here is a method for very scalably um, putting objects onto disk without 
the usual complexities of extent-based file systems. And LUNs and RAIDs, that's out the window with WAS. This talk is really about um, what those engineers have been doing in terms of implementing uh, features, functionality inside those exascalar and grid scalar products to help us scale uh, right to the top of the top 500. In particular, there's some obvious things we can think about. And one is managing reliability, making sure it's all manageable at very li large scales. We've got to make sure the configuration complexity is not too high. And the performance has, of course, got to be good. One important thing that we pay a particular attention to as a result of working with those customers right at the top end is performance protection. And this is essentially saying we often have failures and we need to have good performance even when things are failing. So here's a, a brief summary. Again, this is a huge topic. There's some very, very interesting papers on how disks fail, how disks produce errors, um, including media errors and silent corruptions on the web. And I've kind of summarized it very roughly in one slide here. So at the top, we see that uh, the disk read error rate is constant, and that's been constant over time, whereas obviously disks are getting bigger and bigger. So now on everybody's price list is this four terabyte drive. Um, and of course, there's more bits on that drive, and there's more people moving more bits around. And we're tending to see higher levels of these uh, error rates. Underlying those is all sorts of complexity, right? So sometimes these are media errors, uh, and that means the disk firmware will essentially correct that for you. Some of them are silent errors. So if, if you're all sitting on the head of a disk uh, and looking at those tracks, actually it's quite a wobbly thin line, and sometimes it misses. Uh, so you can have a far off-track write or a near off-track write, and each of those can result in a read that's not consistent with what at least you try to write beforehand. And that's all bundled in, really, to that first bullet point there. The second bullet point is uh, just simply a, a statement of fact, really. If you buy lots of disks, and we picked 50 petabyte system because this was what we expect to be shipping when we ship around 10 petaflops of compute. It's kind of a roughly uh, balanced storage to compute a number. That'll deliver about a terabyte a second, that kind of system there. But if you were to implement that 50 petabyte system, that would be uh, 15,000 disks, and that'll be quite a lot of LUNs as well, probably, probably 1,500 LUNs, depending how you chop that up. And this is going to result in more than one drive failure per day. And part of the point of this work we've been doing is the drive failures themselves are, of course, bad, but what's the performance of your overall file system when you're undergoing a rebuild of that drive that's failed? Bearing in mind, as the bottom line says, and this table implies, you're always in a state of failure for these very large systems. You're always undergoing disk rebuilds. We need to do something about how to cope with the performance when we're doing disk rebuilds. So at large scale, there's some simple things we can do to reduce the complexity. And this is really why uh, a, go a good part of why many customers uh, choose DDN is simply component count. Um, we can't really reduce the number of disks. Okay, that's going to be a lot of disks to get our capacity. But at least we can reduce the number of CPUs, number of memory DIMMs, number of HCAs, number of cables, which are interlinking all those disks and pushing them out to the network. And if having reduced component count obviously means that reduce some, we're reducing the configuration complexity of managing those components. A fairly simple statement. But the point behind that is uh, the DDN controller is a big fat controller. Um, so there's an awful lot of uh, um, bandwidth behind there, 60 gigabytes per second of bandwidth behind the controller. Um, and, that, and there's an awful lot of disk capacity we can put behind that controller. And that means we have overhead. We have a lot of SAS links, a lot of SAS lanes all to all the disks, all redundant. And we have a lot of overhead available in that back end SAS. Uh, uh, disk um, fabric. 
So this is particularly important in a parallel file system. And in a parallel file system, when one disk fails, it doesn't, it's not just one LUN that's impaired, um, it's actually the whole file system. And depending how on, in the Lustre world or the GPFS world, if you're striping your objects around uh, very large numbers of uh, object storage servers or NSDs in the GPFS world, then inevitably you're striping your files across many, many <coughs> LUNs and therefore um, maybe 10 times as many disks. And if one disk is to be degraded and undergoing a rebuild, that can impact the performance of the whole file system. It's not just a subcomponent which uh, gets fixed, it actually impacts the whole file system performance until that rebuild is complete. And what we do, partly in software and partly as a virtue of having this uh, over-provisioned SAS backend, is enable us to reduce the impact of those RAID rebuilds on the front side performance. So these are, those are actually real numbers um, produced not by ourselves, but by a customer, a partner of ours, comparing a, a software RAID a Linux system with uh, the SFA. So furthermore, of course, when you have um, yeah, 15,000 disks, that means inevitably you're having lots and lots of arrays. And uh, in an infinite world, anything can happen. Uh, we're not quite infinite yet, um, but our systems are getting very, very large and strange things happen. <coughs> uh, whole enclosures can fail for one reason or another. So the striping mechanism that we use combined with, as I mentioned, this over-provisioned SAS backend, which allows, means we can allow this zero daisy chaining policy between the controller back to the uh, enclosures, means that we can withstand multiple enclosure failures before we have an impact on data loss. So now some automatic uh, slide changing going on. But I can, I can keep up. This is one of those uh, slides that uh, completes itself. So self-healing. This is another uh, topic we come across a lot. In the SATA world, and sometimes in the SAS world, we can have disks which uh, essentially will lock up. The controllers will lock up. There's a lot of firmware in those disks, and they can go bad without really having any faults. In that case, what we do at uh, DDN is have an automatic power cycle of that individual disk. And during that time, and this is the important part, the IOs to that disk are cached in a special per disk cache. And when that drive, and if that drive comes back healthy, then we can simply replay, partially rebuild that individual disk, which might take minutes. The alternative, of course, is replacing the disk, or even just power cycling that disk, normally would result in a complete disk drive rebuild. And at an average of about 25 megabytes a second, that four, by, four terabyte disk is going to take two or three, maybe four days to uh, rebuild. Okay, we've got this automatic slide forwarding process. Um, so I want to cover just a few more points, and these are more recent um, developments as part of the 12K line. So 12K is a continued evolution of the same million lines of code, but on new hardware, based on new processors and new technologies on the hardware side. Um, of course, it's faster. That's what all this, uh, so the FDR, um, new processors as gives us. There's a new uh, shelf uh, coming out, the 8460. So DDN are kind of well known historically for being the people with the highly dense disk enclosures with 60 drives in 4U. And that's moving now to 84 drives in the same for you. So the chassis is uh, the same depth, no deeper, um, but we've managed to do some clever engineering to fit 40% um, more disks in that enclosure. One of the more interesting areas we've been working on a lot in the past two years, it's been available for a year, and now it's uh, available on steroids with the new hardware, is this idea of embedding the, uh, embedding compute software right into the hardware controller. And uh, this really enables a number of things which were uh, previously not really thought of. The first is that, for example, we can take um, the Lustre object storage servers. We can take them out from being servers out on the network and bring them in and put them on VMs running inside the controller. 
So we can have multiple VMs running the Lustre file system, exporting directly from the controller out to your tens, hundreds, thousands, millions of clients. We can take the GPFS software, we can embed the NSDs inside those controllers and then export uh, GPFS directly from a single controller without these external server and external networking being required. Furthermore, we can take some customer application which would really benefit from very low latency access from compute to storage, and we can embed that inside the controller. So the E you see here, the 12K20E, 12K20E for grid scaler and exascaler, are those package products which will deliver you a Lustre or a GPFS file system embedded within those controllers. And this is a schematic of the benefits it gives you when you put that compute component uh, right onto the controller. We replace what used to be HBAs and links, either SAS or InfiniBand or Fiber Channel, uh, and device drivers. We re replace that layer um, by a special block device driver which will deliver very high low latency access to the VMs running on the controllers themselves. So if I just wait a bit, it'll just change itself. I don't know how it's happening. Uh, management, we have a direct mon, um, which is a, a full management interface, which is based on this API, which launched with SFA 1.5 a couple of months ago. A fully featured API, it's big, um, allows you to do an awful lot of stuff in the API. Direct mon is our own GUI, which will work on GPFS and Lustre. I want to also give a, a big shout out to uh, WAM Cloud, who we uh, work with a lot. They have developed the Chroma um, a GUI for Lustre. And actually, if you come along to the booth, I'll be at the HP booth, the EOFS booth, um, probably some other booths, as well as our own, of course, demonstrating the Chroma GUI, which is a Lustre management system. And we have a demo running, um, and I have access to it, and I can take you through what that looks like, how it goes. Another one of the recent features in SFA 1.5, um, again, released a couple of months ago and uh, running on all this hardware, is uh, better quality of service. So this is something that's really been lacking in the parallel file system world at big scale is how do I guarantee, and I've been kind of talking about this in terms of failure modes, but how do you better guarantee the read quality of service at least um, to your clients across a large scale infrastructure? So what we can do, and you can think about this theoretically, this is, this is quite possible. If a particular disk is being slow, and with 15,000 disks, you can guarantee that one of them is being slow, um, then it's possible to uh, just um, get fed up with that disk and then go ahead and get the data from the available parity in that RAID group. We can just um, create the data that is on that disk that we're waiting for and go direct to the parity. And within SFA 1.5, uh, there's a timeout function which the administrator can tweak in order to say, okay, I'm fed up with waiting for disk X. Let's just go and get that read data directly from the RAID group. So that's a quick spin through. Um, about 30% uh, of the new features in SFA 12K and the SFA 1.5 OS. As I said, we've got a number of uh, demos there. Um, around Chroma and Lustre and GPFS. Um, and uh, we've also got a uh, extended user group uh, session, uh, which is uh, tomorrow, uh, late morning uh, through to lunch, um, where we'll be going through some of, more of, these, some of these features in much more detail and uh, talking about some of the other features which I haven't been had time to talk about today. Uh, so thank you very much. Have you got any questions? Rich. Are, are you shipping the 12K now? It's ga -ing end of June. End of June. We have shipped some, though. We certainly have shipped some. Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Hope to see you later on.